Hi, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. And I just want to start us by saying thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'm Robin Lightcap, and I am the chair of Groundwork Ohio, our statewide advocacy organization for early childhood. And also, I lead Preschool Promise and our early childhood work in Dayton and Montgomery County. And so I just first want to say thank you to all of you who are child care providers across the state for the work you have been doing over these last two weeks. I know it has been incredibly difficult and we really appreciate everything you're doing, whether you've decided to make the difficult choice to close or you've decided to stay open as a temporary pandemic site. All of these decisions are really hard and I know you're doing your best to take care of your staff and your families. So today what we want to do is try to address the many, many, many questions that are out there and also acknowledge that we don't yet have answers to many questions. There are still many unknowns, especially as we all await the passage of this third, third package at the federal level, and hopefully that will come through today. But what we will do is share with you what we do know about if the package does go through, um, how the Senate passed it, we'll share what information we have, and then we'll have to get back together again next week as more information becomes available, but we at least wanted to give you some food for thought. There is a chat room at the bottom of your screen. If you take your mouse down, you can hover over it and you should see a little chat icon. You can post questions there. And we will do our best to answer some of them on the webinar. And for the ones we don't get answered, we are recording all of them. And we will issue questions as soon as they become available. So um, to start us off, and let me just give you a, a high level overview of our agenda today. We're going to start with Karen Lampy from OACCP, who also runs a child care program. She will be sharing some of the information that ODJFS has shared over this last week and provide some clarity on questions that we keep getting from people around the state as best as we can, uh, recognizing that we, none of us, of course, are state officials, but we will do the best we can to share with you the information that has been published by ODJFS. And then we will move into some of our other experts who will talk about the latest on the SBA loans and on unemployment. And then we have one of our national partners with the First Five Years Fund who will share a perspective about childcare at the national level. So that's a high level overview. We are recording this webinar, so you will be able to look at it later and share it with other people on your team who maybe are not able to listen right now. So with that, I would like to ask Karen Lampy to come on and introduce herself and to go ahead and start with some of the questions that we know we're getting from providers across the state. So Karen, see if we can get your camera and your audio on. I see you. Can you hear me too? Yep, I can hear you. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you everybody for being on the call today. Um, we appreciate it and hopefully can get you some information that is helpful as we all keep trying to keep track of um, this very fluid um, situation that we've all found ourselves in. And um, the state did um, put out some great information yesterday. So if you haven't seen it, I would go to the JFS Child Care website. Um, on the right hand side, there is a button you can press for um, providers or for families. And there is lots of information there um, that you can take a look at. Um, there are fact sheets, there is um, there are links to forms, et cetera, that we need during this time. So I'm gonna to refer to some of those as we're talking, um, as well as hopefully give us the most up-to-date information to be helpful um, as we're working on this. As Robin said, I am not from the state. I am a provider myself. Um, however, I've been trying to keep very close tabs on exactly what we need to do here. And so um, we will be doing our best to answer these questions um, factually but I encourage you all to refer back to the JFS website and it looks like Julia just posted the link for it in our um, chat room for you as well. So first, um, obviously we all know that, um, that we had to close as of Wednesday at evening and that now um, the only providers that are operating are those using a temporary pandemic childcare um, license. So either home providers or center providers both 
um, can provide um, temporary pandemic childcare under that license. Um, I'm sure that many of you know that there was um, a lot of people that applied for those licenses. Not necessarily all of those people are actually operating as a pandemic site. Um, but for those of you that are, we have some information today about how um, the billing process will work, the eligibility process, et cetera. But before I get to that, I wanna to talk to those that have um, closed as of Wednesday so that we can talk about how does the payment close out and what will payment look like over um, the closure period. So if your program is not operating a pandemic site, um, or even if you are, and you were a publicly funded program, um, what you will need to do is um, if you closed on Wednesday or any days prior to Wednesday, or I should say closed on Thursday or any days prior to Thursday, you may use your pandemic days for those. You may also use a pandemic day for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this week. Um, we all know kind of how the, the payment week works for publicly funded child care. So that would end our week for publicly funded child care that way. Um, so the, um, it, you'll want to use absent days for any days that you were open up to that point for children that didn't attend. And then if you were closed for any of those days, you'll use a pandemic day. Starting on Sunday, the state is going to pay a, a flat rate for the weeks during the closure of the, um, uh, of the governor's executive order. And so for that, you will have a, um, it'll be the week of January 26th through February 1st payment. So if you go back and look and see what your payment was for that week, that's the payment amount that you will be receiving each week until um, April 30th. Okay, so if you were, if you are a temporary pandemic site, you will do the same thing in order to close out your um, week under your current license and publicly funded child care structure. But starting on Thursday, you will start billing for any of your um, subsidy families that are using your facility, whether they're your kids that were yours prior to that date or new kids that are coming in. And so um, that billing will happen through a spreadsheet, not through the TAP system. Um, the TAP system stopped being used as of yesterday. Um, so for those children, you'll need to fill out, there was a, a form for eligibility and that form is really about making sure that they are an essential employee so you'll need to have a copy of, um, or at least write down that you saw um, something that verify that they are a, um, an essential worker during this time. And then there is a spreadsheet that you'll need to turn in um, for all of your children. So not just your publicly funded children, but for all of your children that show that those are the children that you're serving that are those of essential workers. Um, all pandemic programs must submit that spreadsheet and enrollment verification forms to ODJFS by Monday, March 30th at 10 a.m. So be sure that you turn that in um, by Monday morning. Um, let's see, Robin, what other questions did we yeah, have? So can you clarify how the pandemic day payment works? I know we've talked about this a little bit before, but not everybody understands the professional development days. Okay, so in the TAP system, um, there it will be a drop down bar um, where you'll be able to put in for a pandemic day for a child. And you'll be paid either the full time amount or the part time amount, depending on what their eligibility is. Um, and you can do that for any day that you were closed up to the date of the, the governor's closure, so as of um, Thursday but you may also use it for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this week just to close out the week. After that, the state will switch over to the weekly flat payment that they're gonna pay. Do you need to do anything to get that weekly closure payment? Um, I have not seen clarification on that, but I do not believe you will need to do that. We'll have to get some more clarification from the state on that. And if again, if you are a pandemic 
provider that is still operating, you close out the week Thursday, so yesterday, Thursday, today, Friday, and if you're open on Saturday, you right. turn those in as pandemic days. And then starting on Sunday or Monday, whenever your program is open for next week, that's when you switch to that enrollment spreadsheet that is available when you get your packet back from ODJFS as a temporary pandemic approved site. Correct. Right. Some that's questions about that. Right. And that's how they're verifying that the children that you're serving are those of essential workers. So on that spreadsheet, it asks specifically for, um, for that information so that we know that they're a doctor or a nurse or an EMT, et cetera. And so even if that person does not qualify for PFCC, you still should go ahead and put them on there. That's right. the way I read everything from JFS. Go ahead and put them on there even if you're not getting PFCC payment because the state just wants to understand your enrollment and make sure they're essential workers only who are attending your site, whether the state's paying for them or not. Correct. And at the end of the spreadsheet, it asks, are they publicly funded or are they not? And again, this is how they're going to be able to see exactly how many children are we serving in these pandemic sites, because there's no other way for them to collect that data. Yes. Okay. In the absent days, again, the state increased the number of absent days. So if you had a child who had already used up their 10 for the year, the state increased the number. So and on absent days, you have to enter your hours of operation, but on pandemic days, you do not, correct? On, correct. For absent days, you had to be open, and then you can use absent days for any days that you were open, but the children didn't attend. And then pandemic days for any days that you were closed before the governor's announcement or the closure date or for Thursday, Friday, Saturday after his closure date. And from what you read, switching back to our, our temporary pandemic sites here again, yes. should they be submitting that enrollment sheet every Monday morning? I know they need to send the first one in by Monday, March 30th, but as enrollment changes in the weeks ahead, should they be submitting that enrollment how frequently? So that's another piece I haven't gotten clarification on, but I have mm -hmm. a feeling it's going to be a weekly um, sheet that you have to send them. Um, they will be paying by enrollment. So in those of us that have been doing publicly funded childcare are so used to them paying by attendance, it's hard for us to absorb that a little bit, but they will be paying by enrollment the weekly full-time rate for anybody, any child that attends during that week that is publicly funded. And just to clarify, providers are determining who is an essential worker based on the documentation provided by the state and the stay at home order. There is a complete list and they should be providing verification as is stated in the ODJFS rules and clarification, but they're not waiting for the state to get back to them and approve them. That is correct. Providers are making the determination whether or not they're an essential worker. The state, however, is still doing eligibility for if they are publicly funded, but the, the right. provider will be doing the, or I should say the county is doing the eligibility for publicly funded. The um, provider is doing the eligibility if they're an essential worker. Right. Okay. Um, the, I, got, I see another question about which week is the state using to determine the publicly funded closure rate? I believe it's February 26th to March 1st. Do I have that? No, wait, I said those dates wrong. January, yeah. March 1st. January, say it again. January 26th to March 1st. Or, I'm sorry, February. February. <laughs> now I've confused you. Sorry. March 26th to February 1st. Right. And the num the amount of pay for a pandemic day is eight hours, correct? Full time, correct. For a full yeah, if your child's authorized full time, it would be eight hours of pay. Okay. Um, I know we haven't gotten to every single question, but I think we've covered some of them. So Anything else, Karen, that you can think of? I, I think the other thing I see some chat about is the fact that, yes, the ratios changed. And obviously, we really respect the state for making that hard decision to lower ratios and group size to keep our teachers and our children safe. So having that one to six or the one to four or two to six in the infant classroom. However, we all understand that dramatically increases your cost of operation. And we know that's a challenge. Um, so I'm just acknowledging those of you who are commenting on that in the chat room, even though we don't have a great solution on that. 
Yes, unfortunately, we do not have a great solution on that, but that is obviously a huge um, driver of cost. And so it is something we continue to have conversations with the state um, about at this point. And um, you know, once we have a few days of operating the temporary pandemic sites and have a better feel for supply and demand and what our challenges are gonna be ahead, I think that will be um, one of the top questions that we have. So on that um, piece, one of the things that I wanted to share with everyone is that the Ohio Association of Child Care Providers put together a temporary pandemic child care provider focus group. Um, and that focus group is communicating with each other very often. Um, and as part of that, they also are looking at ways that they can reach out to other temporary pandemic child care programs um, to be able to create a space where they can all collaborate with each other, share policies, ideas, questions, answer questions for each other in real time. And so we have put together a um, private Facebook page that um, any um, temporary pandemic child care provider, whether you're a um, home provider or a center provider can be a part of this group. And, um, and there's an ability then for you to share ideas and thoughts with each other. Um, and it'll also be a way that we are going to raise up questions to the state from what we're learning now. Um, we will provide feedback to the state. And then in addition to that, we will be doing um, weekly, um, at least at this point, we think they're gonna be weekly um, Zoom calls as well, um, just about the temporary pandemic um, child care programs and to support you all with that along the way. Again, an opportunity to share um, your experiences. Obviously there is no roadmap around operating a temporary pandemic site. We don't want people to spend time um, reinventing the wheel. If there's a provider already out there that's <clears throat> they can share it with the rest of the group. So Julia, um, I saw a couple people asking for that Facebook page again. If you could pop that up. Um, the name of the Facebook page is um, Ohio Temporary Pandemic Child Care Providers. And so you can just search that in Facebook and it'll come up and it'll ask you just to answer some simple questions in order to join the group. Um, and then um, you, you'll see when you get in there, we've already got some questions for folks to start answering and sharing. That's great. Thank you very much, Karen. I know that will be really helpful. I also want to acknowledge, I know a number of you run centers that might not have publicly funded child care, and we recognize that there is a tremendous need to help essential workers who are continuing to keep our community safe, who don't qualify for PFCC, the state is not, as, as we all know in the communication we received this week, the state is not paying for people who are essential workers who do not qualify for PFCC. But I do know that many of us at a local level are working on trying to get scholarship funds, trying to get um, foundations to help support those uh, providers who are offering this service to essential workers. So I encourage you to get in touch with whomever your local folks might be. I know if you are not a nonprofit, it's hard to apply for that grant yourself, but there are people organizing efforts around the state. So that's the best answer I have for you right now on addressing that difficult question. Rob, and I also see a question in here about, um, I know we have to email them to withdraw as far as if you want off the list of temporary yes. pandemic. So yes, please email them at the same email address where you put in your application to let them know if you are not going to be providing um, services as a temporary pandemic site. Um, and they'll be taking your name then off of that list. Um, you will still get paid for Thursday and Friday if that's the case. You'll use your pandemic days um, in the TAP system to get paid for those days. And then you will switch to the um, weekly payment if you're publicly funded. Again, if you're, if you're private pay only, that's a different situation. Okay, great, Karen. I know we could go on and on answering more questions, but I think we will move on for the moment and we're going to, thank you, Karen, for your help with all of that. Um, we're going to move next to Michelle Davis, who is with Citywide based here in Dayton. And she has been studying all of the information on small business loans and the loans that are coming at the federal level. 
So Michelle, if you could share updates for us, recognizing that we're still waiting for legislation to pass in the House, hopefully today, and then there'll have to be rules that give the fine details about everything. But if you could help us understand, there are lots of questions about what's out there. Can we, can you, oh, there you are, I hear you, yep. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, and things are changing. However, the emergency injury disaster loans, I just want to give a, a little bit of a, a brief update, and then I want to talk about two other things that the International Economic Development Council has put out. They have actually outlined the stimulus package and made it um, a little un easier for the rest of us to understand. So, first of all, with the emergency in injury disaster loans, the some of the updates that have come through is they're going to waive personal guarantees. They're going to waive um, if you've only been in business for one year, they're going to waive that requirement. Uh, they're going to be very flexible on borrower eligibility. There's also with that program, you can actually ask for an emergency grant of up to $10,000. That grant, if in the event that the um, loan is not um, approved for you, you actually potentially do not have to pay that money back. That's what this document says. So that being said, I'm, I'm going to kind of leave that there because we covered this loan repeatedly. It's the one that the SBA is assisting in and that you can actually apply for now. However, let's change focus a little bit because there is another program that the SBA is going to be providing through the 7A program, which will be through preferred, uh, preferred lender providers, which are banks such as Chase, Huntington, any of the big banks, basically, Key, others. Um, and what that does is it is the Paycheck Protection Program, and it includes everybody from independent contractors, sole proprietors, and people who are self-employed. And it helps with um, payroll, it helps with insurance, rent, mortgage, and utility expenses that you've paid while you've either been shut down or during this time. So the two are similar but different. Uh, one takes your revenue and your gross profit into consideration. The other takes expenses into consideration. So once this gets approved, there's going to have to be a little bit of analysis that you're going to have to sit down and do. And you may want to sit down with a banker, a CPA, an attorney, or somebody at a CDC, which is what Citywide is, to look at what might be more advantageous for you to take. The PPP program has a, what I call a um, forgivable portion. I don't really know exactly what that, that forgivable portion is going to all encompass, but this loan, if you apply for it, it may have a portion of it that's gonna be forgiven over several months. And then it, whatever is not forgiven uh, the repayment can start at any time, but as of 12-31-2020, it will convert automatically to a 10-year loan at a 4% interest rate. So those things are, those two loans are a little bit different in the fact that the SBA disaster relief loan has a 30-year maximum life. This one only has a 10-year. However, this one has the benefit of the forgivable side. Both have deferred payments for six to 12 months, depending on what you think you're gonna need. So you don't have to start paying those the month after the loan is closed. Um, the one thing I don't know about the Paycheck Protection Program is other than applying at a bank, what all is gonna be required. I imagine it's gonna be the same things as the SBA um, EIDL loans is what they're calling them and it's, they're, they're referencing them as emergency injury disaster loans. So there's gonna to have to be a little bit of analysis on that side of things once this all gets going. Um, changing, changing. Um, can I stop you I for a second, Michelle? Sure. Yeah. So yeah. can you clarify, because we're getting some questions like, what if I'm a small nonprofit? What if I'm a religious nonprofit? What if I'm for profit? 
who all is eligible for who or who is likely to be eligible for these two options you're talking about, the EIDL and this PPP option of support? Okay, so the EIDL, any for-profit and any public or private nonprofit, but that does not include religious affiliated. They still have not waived that. This, the EIDL loan also has included at this point, tribal businesses, cooperatives, ESOPs, individual contractors, sole proprietors, and private nonprofits, like I said, and that is with less than 500 employees. I think in my, this would probably cover a lot of the type A and B in, in home providers because they don't, they only have like maybe one person on payroll. I think the EIDL loan might be a little bit better for them. Um, but like I said, the analysis would have to be done. Then on the Paycheck Protection Program, it, in, it includes for-profit and non-profits. And I, I don't have any information on religious affiliated. It doesn't say whether it does or doesn't like the EIDL loan does. However, it does include independent contractors, sole proprietors, and self-employed. So the religious uh, affiliation has not been waived at this point, but with the, um, the tribal businesses being included now, I, I'm kind of starting to wonder if that is going to be included when this is all said and done. So basically stay tuned if you're a religious affiliate to see if that's something that gets waived to allow you to access the funding. Right. Okay. Um, you, you had talked about a summary. Uh, you know, one of the questions we're getting is where can you read a summary of this? Because, of course, we're all trying to digest it. And I know I personally am receiving lots of different summaries from all different sources, and sometimes they don't all match up. So is there a source that you would recommend that folks look to to see the latest and greatest on, on the summary of these options? Well, I referenced the International Economic Development Council uh, document that I sent you yesterday, Rob, and the reason I do is because it's very easy to read and understand. Mm -hmm. There are other documents that are out there, and I sent a couple of them to you. Some of them are very convoluted, and, and I makes my head spin just getting through the first page, mm -hmm. but then there are, there are others that are very um, well written, like the Interna International Economic Development Council page and you can probably go to their website and pull this off I would imagine I, it was sent to me by somebody at um, the downtown Dayton partnership and um, this is what it looks like and we're gonna we will send it to you all in an email follow-up um, because I, I did not send Julia this link so she can't put it in the chat room right now but we'll send it to you in our email follow-up and post it on our websites Okay. Um, the other Thanks. thing I want to talk about, Robin, real quick is the yep, unemployment yep. insurance, because I saw somebody ask that question. So mm -hmm. in this document that I'm referencing, it says, creates a temporary pandemic unemployment assistance program for those not traditionally covered by unemployment insurance, including the self-employed, independent contractors, and those with limited work history. So for those of you who are asking about unemployment, um, I think the, in, you haven't historically had unemployment insurance. I believe that that is going to be covered. I think that you should apply. They have opened it up for all kinds of self-employed and independent contractors, which was not originally done. I know like the um, salon beauty side of things, you know, they got shut down as well. And uh, I've had two friends that have, were declined initially, reapplied after this update came out, and have um, are are going to be eligible for unemployment now. Yep. So that I'm seeing that referred to as PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. In case any of you are looking for that information, they are widening the number of people who are eligible for that. Okay. Um, Anything else, Michelle? No, I know you had a couple questions and I couldn't print that off before I came in here because I was on another phone call. Um, yeah, that's okay. Other questions? Okay. So I think other questions we need to answer. 
Well, just to clarify too, the way I'm understanding the PPP program, this Paycheck Protection Program, that is for an employer who decides to continue to pay people during this pandemic time period. So that's a key differential Correct. between that and the EIDL. So I just want to make sure people understand that you would have to continue to pay your employees. And the way I read it too, is if you have already laid them off, but you bring them back and start paying them, you could be eligible for that. But there are certain limitations around it. And just like Michelle said, you really need to analyze both the options before you decide what is best for you. And where should and they go? It's, it, like one person oh, said, I think in the chat room that they went to the bank and the bank didn't have information yet. So can you explain what a CDC is? I'm not sure everyone knows what that is. And then when you would think the bank would start to be ready to handle these questions. Okay, so what, we're CDC. So it's a certified development corporation. So basically we have two sides. We have the um, community development side and we have the business development side, which is where I sit. Um, the one other thing, Robin, that I want to mention real quick so I don't forget is if you apply for the PPP program, you cannot apply for the EIDL program. Now, what I'm trying to get clarification for from the SBA is can you apply for both and then take the one that is best for you? Because in this document, it says that you cannot apply or carry loans from both programs. So I'm trying to get a little clarification because in my opinion, I think that you should be allowed to apply for both and then take the program that meets your needs the best. Um, I didn't want to forget. So sorry, I didn't mean mm -hmm. to get off track again, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that because you cannot take both. You can only take one or the other. Um, right. So then what happens is at the bank level, so CDCs, we can do SBA 504 programs and we assist with like disaster relief. It still goes to the disaster relief group, but we help facilitate some of the um, initial documentation gathering and such like that that you're going to upload to the SBA disaster relief group. Um, that's what a CDC does. And then the banks do what are called 7A loans. And those loans encompass everything from working capital, leasehold improvements to other things. For this, it's going to be basically working capital, which is going to be your payroll on the PPP program. That's the 7A um, program that you'll be using. It's still an SBA program, but it's, it's on the 7A instead of the disaster relief side. You apply for that at the bank. You're right, the banks probably don't have a lot of information. And if you are talking to a branch manager instead of a business banker or a commercial lender, that could be the disconnect at the bank right now. Um, if you are talking to a business banker or a commercial lender, these things are coming down daily. I know that one of the child care facilities that I have been working with, they initially inquired about getting a line of credit to carry them through this, this uh, period. And the banker is like, no, we're not doing that right now. We're waiting to see what happens in the stimulus. He called him yesterday or the day before and stated that they were going to start doing loans for these things and to hold tight that he would be back in touch. So you're right. It is not an exact science right now because everything is still in flux a little. So just be patient. And can you explain, if, can you remind everybody about if you already have an SBA loan, first about the deferment, and then how does it relate to me if I want to apply for one of these new things being offered under the SBA heading? Can I do that still? Yes, you can. So, you, so payment deferral, if you currently have an SBA loan standing out there, they are encouraging you to do up to six months of deferred payments. Now we have people doing six months, we have people doing three months. It just kind of depends on your situation. So what you can do is you defer the payments and then that way you don't have to use your pandemic loan money to continue to pay those payments through the next six months to help you get caught up with your cash flow um, reduction right now because that's, that's what's gonna happen if you continue to pay those. Um, you can still apply for these. These do not, that deferment has no effect on either of these programs. They will be, you know, there's, collateral is 
kind of king. So if you own the facility that you run your daycare facility out of, or your child care facility out of, then you will be able to get more than 25,000 for, and that's for the EIDL loan. If you don't have, if you don't have real estate collateral, collateral, but you have other collateral, they will take it. They're taking any kind of collateral and that's for both programs, just so you know. Um, but the PPP program, from what I am to understand, the collateral, it waives collateral and personal guarantees. So for some of that, you won't have to have collateral on the PPP program unless it gets above a certain dollar amount. And I can't find that right now. That was, I think, in a conference call that we were on yesterday where they were talking about once you get to a certain dollar amount on the Paycheck Protection Program that there would be collateral preferred. Um, however, if you've got good standing credit and you've got good numbers on historical years, you're probably going to get it anyways. Okay, great. Um, I saw one person say maybe that Congress just or the uh, House just passed it. Um, Hopefully that's true. I haven't seen it yet myself, but hopefully that's coming through. The other thing that I want to acknowledge that overlaps and into unemployment is in the way I am reading some of the unemployment information, they might people on unemployment might be eligible for six hundred dollars a week on top of unemployment. And sadly, we all know that many people in the childcare world are not even paid $600 a week, which is about $15 an hour, because we all know the challenges we have in, in getting adequate funding for this field. So that is a real concern to think about our teachers making more on unemployment than they do working at a pandemic site or a regular site. So I just wanna to acknowledge to everyone that this is something that from an advocate perspective, we all are talking about, and we know this is an issue. We've got to see how all the rules come out and unemployment about who all will be eligible for that, but that certainly is an issue. And I see CNN reports that the House has passed the bill, so hallelujah. Hopefully more details will be coming very quickly than over the weekend. Um, hey Robin, just one more thing. Yeah. That $600 per week is only for four months, so keep in, in mind, I yeah. know that that's still gonna be an advantage for people who are not currently working in your field, but um, keep in mind that that's not going to be forever. So right. um, it's just one thing additional. And then anybody, I, I saw, I did see a question about if I'm already in application process with like somebody like Citywide for an SBA loan, um, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. If you're comfortable continuing to apply for the loan, continue to apply for the loan. Um, especially if it's uh, related to you purchasing real estate for uh, your current facility that you're going to move into there or something like that, that isn't necessarily going to change anything. The government already expects you to have cash flow issues through this. So they're going to look at it. And we're going to look at 18 and 19 numbers when we're doing a 504. We're not going to, we want year to date, but we're not going to consider, we're going to Put into consideration that this is going on we're not going to look past that so if you're comfortable continuing with it and understanding that you may have a little bit of cash flow um, issues in the initial we can understand that too and i think they are even with the sba loans because we have two that are approved that have not funded yet so they are already taking steps to um, have documents drawn up stating that this is due to the uh, COVID-19 um, epidemic. So just keep that in mind. Just keep moving forward. You should be fine on that. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we're going to move on because I, I'm just cognizant of, of time. I want you all to know we've ha we did have over 800 people on the call, which is why we're not able to answer all of your questions. I really wish we could answer all of the questions, but we can't answer them all right now. But we are recording them, so please go ahead and put them in there, and then we're going to do our best to answer what we can in FAQs, etc. Um, also, we're recording this, so if you have to go, you can watch the recording later. We are going to cover unemployment at the end of this call, but I want to thank Michelle for your answers and for being on. If, if we have time at the end, we can come back to more of this. But 
Now I want to ask our state, or I'm sorry, our, our national partner with First Five Years Fund. I really appreciate Sarah taking time to be on and give us an update about at a higher kind of level on the childcare system, what's happening with movement in the federal government to support childcare across our country. So Sarah, thank you for taking a minute to be with us. Oh, you know, thank you for letting me be on and I will, I've been able to listen in for a little bit now. Um, and not surprisingly, everyone out in the real world doing real work in the midst of this crisis um, is way ahead of Congress and prepared <laughs> for when they <laughs> finally wrap up, which they have done. So that's that's all really good news. And I think um, the other really great thing to hear and know is that you all are thinking about what relief is coming from the feds in um, holistically and, and how and that really is how they approach this two plus trillion dollar bill. Um, and so, um, and I would, I would just kind of flag as well that this is the third relief package um, that they've passed over the course of the past month. Um, and so what happened around paid leave and some of the initial things in the second phase um, where they were not industry specific, so they didn't do things to help out industries like childcare or airlines or restaurants or whomever, everybody needs it. Um, and certainly healthcare providers as well. Um, so this, this package that went through today and the president will take care of hopefully soon, um, as soon as they can get it down the street, um, really does seek to address, mo uh, you know, not just the economy, but also um, families who are struggling and looking at it holistically for the field is, is really, really great. Um, there is a $3.5 billion bump in the CCDBG. I think what's important about that bump is that it is um, tied and connected very much to the waivers and flexibility that have come out from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, really early on um, and meant to really help. Um, Congress's intent with that was to be as flexible as possible, recognizing that every state is up against unbelievable need whether um, for, for not just subsidy, this is much beyond that. So I think there's there's a lot there. We certainly um, look at how the, we are really interested in seeing how the small business pieces are playing out um, as you are going down this really ambitious path of making sure that you're able to um, take advantage of them. I think there'll be a lot learned that we're gonna have to work really quickly to kind of grasp hold of. Um, in order to be able to um, articulate back to Congress when they come back either for a fourth bill phase or appropriations, whichever comes first, um, what really is needed on top of what is currently getting out there. I would also flag a couple of other things outside of child care. Um, one is there was money included for Head Start, so I just kind of want to flag that as well. And there's also an um, there is relief going directly to states um, and we're still looking into those provisions and how they could be allowable for child care recognizing that states um, are you know everything's closed down except for child care or there's child care needs um, whereas you know schools are closed um, in you know in some cases indefinitely so I would I would just kind of flag that um, that provision as well as something that we're keeping an eye on um, we've done a look across the bill initially um, and we'll continue to do that and provide resources on our site we have a side-by-side -side that shows all of those and we also have a link to resources from some of our partners who we've been working with at the national level um, and what they've put out. So there are some SBA things there, um, certainly Child Care Aware of America and others who have um, who have jumped on and the Alliance for Early Success um, who've jumped on it early. But I think those will continue to be updated now that this bill is passed and there can be some support um, uh, to, to help take advantage of some of the provisions that aren't necessarily um, as familiar with us in, in the community. So um, I'm happy to take questions, you know, very high level. You have a lot more work to do <laughs> um, than we do, but really interested in staying um, in touch and learning more as this process unfolds so that we can make sure that we're really informing the next phase of what Congress does in this regard, specifically as it relates to the childcare industry, um, because we know it's suffering greatly. 
Yeah, we, we really appreciate your advocacy at the federal level. I think certainly continuing to support our low income and our subsidized programs is critical, but the support for our private pay is, is equally critical um, as they try yeah. to figure out how to open their doors again on the other side of this. I just, I think we have to keep that front and center. Can well, you talk about, or go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, Robin, that, you know, it, th there's so much intense work happening minute by minute right now, but I think from a policy perspective going forward, you're raising a really important point that we've been thinking about, which is that this crisis has surfaced um, some real needs in the child care or child around child care writ large. Um, and so I think there's a, it's a, a real robust conversation coming down the pike about all of that. That's right. good. And I don't know if you can speak to the CACFP program, but I know I saw some new provision that allows people to continue to serve potentially. I, I don't have it memorized yet, so I don't want to speak to it inappropriately. Do you happen to know details on that? Or maybe Karen, you can get back on because I know we were emailing about the food program. Hi, this is Karen. There were some in earlier bills, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I haven't seen anything in this bill, but there was some information that came out from the Department of Ed yesterday around CACFP. Mm -hmm. It is posted on OACCP's website if anybody would like to take a look at it and also on our Facebook page. Um, so I would encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, I have not been able to dig in yet to see exactly what they've said at this point. But CACFP, um, we haven't gotten a whole lot of information on yet, but there is a conference call next Tuesday um, about CACFP as well. Great, thank you. I think they, I think they're definitely paying the pandemic centers for food is the way I understand it. And then um, what they're doing about if you continue to serve food from your site, that part is not clear to me. So. Yes, I see see people in the chat room saying that they are definitely getting paid for their pandemic center to provide food. So that's good news. Okay, Sarah, we really appreciate your work at a federal level. Please carry on on behalf of all of us. We need your help. Um, so thank you very much. We couldn't do it without, without you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, we... I, have another expert on our panel, Jillian Bradshaw, who's an attorney with Porter Wright. And again, this is another area where we still have a lot more questions than answers, but unemployment is top of mind for our child care providers, Jillian. So thank you for being on again with us. Sure thing, my pleasure, Alba. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna dive in and cover what what we do know, or at least some general guidelines, because I know our providers are facing difficult decisions about whether they should lay people off, terminate them, furlough them, what's the right word to use if they've decided to close their program or reduce hours, et cetera. So maybe we can start with some of that general guidance again about what people should be thinking about as they make decisions on their employees pursuing unemployment. Sure, sure. So the decision about um, unemployment compensation on an employee level is, is really sort of a granular one and it's hard to make any, any sort of comprehensive statements about who will be eligible and who will not be eligible. Um, but I think probably a good place to start is that um, employees who generally would apply to receive unemployment compensation are those employees who have been separated from employment, either layoff, furlough, or termination. And mind you, those words mean pretty much the same thing, very small variances. Um, and, and that happens to the employee through no fault of their own, right? Something happens in their lives that means that they just, they're, they're not working anymore. I know one of the questions was, can an employee who is afraid of exposure then quit their job and apply for unemployment compensation? And that answer is generally no, generally no. Um, now under these additional circumstances with what, you know, this bill that's sitting on the president's desk right now, 
um, that may change some things, but my understanding of employment compensation as it stands today does not allow for a voluntary separation, meaning an employee chooses to leave their job. Unemployment suggests that there was no other choice. So can you explain the difference between furlough and layoff? That, that's confusing a lot of folks. Yeah, there, there really is no difference, Robin, I've got to tell you. Um, generally what we see, I guess I say there's no difference, that really is from a legal standpoint. Um, but from a semantic standpoint, we often hear the word furlough used when an employer lays a group of employees off and is no longer paying them wages, but is still able to carry them on their health insurance plan. So if you're furloughed, you're still technically employed by way of being a covered insurable life, but you are still eligible to receive unemployment compensation. We see the word furlough used with federal employers most often. Um, the term layoff is just a nicer way of saying terminated. Uh, the word layoff suggests that the employer intends to bring people back when revenue is being generated again as on a rolling basis, uh, generally. And then terminated is really just sort of the cut and dry way of putting it, meaning you no longer have a job. Okay, and just, I know we covered this a little last week, but just real quickly again, what if I am a church or a religious affiliated nonprofit? Am I able to have my employees apply for this? So right now the advice that you're given is that employees should apply. However, it's unclear as to whether or not they're going to be granted unemployment compensation. And much of that really depends on how the employer has paid their taxes. Did the employer contribute to the unemployment insurance taxes, or did they opt to be on a reimbursable basis? So the employee may be eligible, and the thing to do is to encourage employees to apply and let the Ohio Job and Family Services make that decision. Um, and the employer will need to be cognizant that if they did not contribute from a tax standpoint initially, they may be on the hook for that compensation on a reimbursable basis, but I will tell you, Robin, with this um, piece of legislation that's sitting on the president's desk right now, I don't know if employers are going to be held accountable for that. The answer might be no. So, so given that, the best advice that we can give to employees is to just go apply. And, and what advice can you give to the employers about whether or not they should continue to try to supplement wages if somebody's on unemployment? I know the 20% guideline, but can you speak anything new to that or remind people about what we do know? Yeah, so I think it, it's worth definitely visiting. Prior to this federal legislation that we're waiting to be signed right now, the idea was if the employee was making 20% or less less than their regular wages. So if, for instance, the employer was able to keep them on for a fifth of the amount of the hours that they had before that, um, that employee could apply for benefits based on their reduced hours and the amount of their benefit would not change. Now, if that employee is experiencing a reduction in hours, but let's say it's half of their hours have been cut, then the amount of benefit benefit that they're going to receive is going to be reduced. Um, and that's, that's sort of a good segue into sort of what we are hoping to see out of this coronavirus relief package that's you know, waiting to be signed. Um, there are two things built into that. Uh, so, and I, I think that has, some of this has been mentioned already, but I'll just chat about it again, just in case. Um, embedded within that, is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, the PUA that you mentioned, and that will cover people who are unable to work because of the coronavirus outbreak. That includes independent contractors, uh, people who are sick, and other people called gig workers, right? Um, and that also likely will apply to people who are self-employed. So um, I believe that is 
B providers uh, may benefit greatly from this pandemic unemployment assistance if it exists the way that we understand it today. Um, the second thing that's built into this legislation is this idea of this extra $600 uh, per week for the next four months. Um, and if that out the way that we think it shakes out, the way that it's sort of written uh, as we understand it, is that it is going to be in addition to the unemployment compensation benefit that an already approved person uh, will receive. So if you're a person in Ohio and you have lost your job, you've been laid off and applied for unemployment compensation and you've been approved, this, right, this portion of this legislation basically means that you're gonna get an extra $600 per week for the next four months. Sort of no questions asked. Um, so that extra $600 is not going to affect what you are receiving, receiving at the state level. And, okay, so, and you're saying it doesn't matter if they use the term layoff or furlough as far as what they're eligible for. I know there was some chatter about Marriott employees getting denied because they were furloughed for a while there in the news or something I don't know if you can speak to anything about that, but I, I just know people are having to make these decisions right now and they want to make sure their employees are able to get whatever f access to funds that are available for them. So I just want to make sure mm -hmm. as clear as we can be about what they should be saying to their employees as they fill out the forms. Right. So I think a good, safe way to, cl to sort of classify um, an employer's best bet in helping an employee be eligible um, is, to, is to classify it as a layoff. You're separating employment. You're keeping them on your books. Um, they no longer have a job. And uh, as difficult as that is, I think, I think a lot of employers are searching for ways to say that, but in a way that's nicer, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. no, despite um, you know, all the things that are going on. Um, a layoff is really um, what unemployment is built to us. Okay. A furlough, yeah, furlough suggests that that employee is still on the books and insured. So, you know, if you perhaps don't have folks or you're, you know, you don't have a large portion of your employees who qualify or elect to be on a health insurance benefit that you offer, I term furlough, uh, I just tend to avoid uh, in general because it's not something really has enough defined parameters to make sense in the unemployment world. So it's okay to call it a layoff because that's really what it is. And I see the chat room and all the anxiety about this $600 a week and how are we going to get any employees back to our centers if they can make more on unemployment. And I just, I just want to acknowledge that. I hear you all. We are concerned about this too. But like was already mentioned, this is not a funding source that will be available forever. <laughs> this is short term. So it's not like they're going to be able to collect $600 a week into perpetuity. This is, is going to have a finite right now. I think it's four months. So yeah, I see somebody just said that in the chat room. Um, yeah, and I think something to be mindful of, Robin, in that process is that $600, um, a, uh, an employee is only eligible for that if they are also eligible to receive unemployment benefits from the state. So if at any point your state level eligibility changes, meaning you now have, or you know, in other words, um, if you are now available and able to work, you can, you can't, you, you can't elect to continue receiving unemployment compensation in that instance. So um, for employers, sort of peace of mind, when the revenue starts to come back up again and you're able to rehire these folks, they can't just say, hey, no thanks, I'm getting unemployment. They have to take the job back. They want to um, earn money that way. But if they uh, decline to come back to the job that you've offered, they will no longer be eligible to receive unemployment compensation benefits. Mm -hmm. 
There, I think there's a question when you fill out unemployment that asks if you are currently looking for a job and you have to say yes or no to that. Is, do you have any like thoughts about how we should answer that question? Yeah, so the way I understand it, um, the requirement for people to seek a job every week in order to remain eligible is being waived during the period okay. of this pandemic. Uh, so if you're asked, if you're being asked that question every week as you apply, um, right now you don't have to say yes or no, or it doesn't really matter how you answer because it's not going to matter. Now, when this pandemic begins to lift, you know, if the governor says that daycares can start operating the way they operated before, um, then when you fill out your unemployment application every week, um, it is likely that you will have to be looking for a job in order to continue to be eligible. Okay, and can you clarify about benefits, health insurance, about if I lay someone off, I am not providing the health benefits, I believe. Can you just confirm? That's correct, yep. Okay. Um, trying to see, I think that, uh, yeah. let's see, can you talk about whether or not they're having part-time employees be eligible for unemployment? Part-time is still included, right? I mean, there's the general guidelines you have to meet, but it, being part-time mm -hmm. does not exclude you from unemployment. That's correct. That's correct. Just um, for part-time employees, a good thing to remember is that the unemployment benefit that you may receive is not going to equal to what you would normally make if you were working full-time. So it's likely, you know, if your hours have been cut, say, down to half, um, that you will be able to receive some form of unemployment supplemental compensation, but it is not going to equal what you would earn if you were actually working. Right. Thank you. Okay. I think that I think we're covering some of the questions. I know we're not answering all of your questions, everyone, but we'll do our best to try to document things going forward. Um, so Jillian, we thank you for being on and helping us process this confusing <laughs> information as it's constantly changing. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's my pleasure entirely, Robin. I think, you know, sort of a note for all the product, because I see the questions coming in too. Um, when the questions start to begin to be very nuanced based on, you know, my particular uh, daycare center or my particular employees, there is a lot that needs to be discussed in being able to make a determination. So I can understand how attendees are like, well, wait, this doesn't answer my question because we have to speak in generalities when an, we have got an audience this big. But um, mm -hmm. just encouraging mm -hmm. folks to think through, write your questions down. And uh, hopefully with uh, Robin's help, as she continues so diligent in this, we can get to some answers to you. Yeah, thank you everybody for, for chiming in. I do wanna come back to, to Karen. Um, you had talked about there is, we know a lot of providers are asking the question if I have publicly funded children and their approval is going to expire ODJFS is working on clarification on extensions related to eligibility for families on, on publicly funded child care. So please stay tuned to your emails for information on that from ODJFS because that will be changing. Karen, if I've missed anything on that, feel free to chime in and interrupt me if there's anything to add. No, I just wanted to make sure that we had a, a chance to tell people that we should be getting information um, hopefully in the next day or so from uh, ODJFS about this, that they are working on um, extending eligibility for anyone that's getting ready to expire. Okay, great. And um, I think those are, I think that's covering all of the topics that we wanted to at least touch on today. We um, do want to say that we will continue to look at when the next best time is for a webinar like this as we get more information. Obviously, we hope the president signs this quickly and then rules are put in place so that we can interpret the details of these various options. So stay tuned for that. Julie has put up on the screen other things that we would ask for your help with. 
Groundwork is collecting stories and information from providers, whether you've decided to close or stay open. It helps us to advocate for things, whether you're a private um, pay provider or publicly funded or a family childcare, we know that everyone is facing serious challenges about how we make decisions during this period and then how we think about opening on the other side of it. So please share your stories. We will continue to advocate we will continue to lift up the importance of childcare in our communities to support our essential workers and workers in general. Um, but we really appreciate everything you're doing and we hope that this information can start to help as you're making difficult decisions. And we will get through this, all of us together, one way or the other. So have a good weekend. We thank you, everybody. We'll leave the chat room up if you wanna ask any more questions that we can record for going forward.